This screencast corresponds to chapter 13 on the behavior of gases and the gas laws. In particular, today we will cover the combined gas law. So you should know that behavior of gases depends on four variable, variables. On the temperature in degrees Kelvin, it's important to recognize that all of temperatures in the gas laws chapter will be in Kelvin degrees. If you do your mathematics in degrees Celsius, it will not work. You will get the wrong answer. But you guys know that if you heat up a gas, it tends to expand. And uh, if we squeeze down a gas, in other words, uh, if we change the volume, the pressure is going to increase. If we increase pressure, it's going to change volume and temperature. And of course, the fourth variable that gas behavior depends on is the number of particles. Simply, if we add more gas to a rigid container, it's going to increase pressure. So um, all the other variables will change in response to changing just one. So again, again as an example, if I increase the number of of particles of gas, it's going to increase the pressure, the volume is going to expand, and the temperature is going to go up. So they all are in interdependent. Now, not a lot to know on this slide. We're going to be using uh, assumptions of what's called an ideal gas. And an ideal gas is a made-up thing. Uh, real gases ha do have attractive or repulsive forces between molecules, uh, and they um, don't always have the same kinetic energy at a given temperature. But the assumptions of an ideal gas it works pretty well. We're able to predict volumes and temperatures uh, based on some assumptions. Um, the two that I think are the most important for you guys are uh, numbers two and three. Uh, gas particles are really, really tiny, but the space between them is ginormous. It's almost like the model of the nucleus compared to the volume of the atom. Nucleus is really small. The atom is huge. Remember, we use the, uh, the idea of a football stadium and a basketball at the center would be the nucleus and the size of the atom and the electron uh, cloud would be the size of the rest of, of Buckeye Stadium, for example. Gas do the same thing. There's a whole lot of empty space between particles, and that's why gases are compressible. Um, in addition, I think the, scratch number three, that's not so important. Uh, number five is important to know. We assume that at a certain temperature, all of the particles in a gas have the same kinetic energy, but that's not in fact true. The average, it's actually more like a distribution. Uh, there will be some particles at, a, let's say we have a temperature of zero degrees. So this would be the average temperature, right? Zero degrees Celsius, or in other words, 273 Kelvin. Um, there will be some particles that have a much higher and a much lower uh, average kinetic energy of that, but the assumptions of the gas law say we're going to assume all of them have an equal um, kinetic energy. Now, uh, skipping ahead, we're going to um, start talking about the units that we use in describing gases, and we use pressure, air pressure. And this was first discovered or at least elucidated by this great uh, looking Italian chemist from the late 1600s named Evangelista Torricelli. And that name Torricelli is important because he invented the first barometer. And barometer measures air pressure, essentially the force of air, look at these blue arrows down here, the force of air pushing down on a dish of mercury causes it to rise up into uh, an inverted, sort of an inverted test tube, okay? Um, and that measurement, that height happened to, happen to be at, um, at sea level, uh, air pressure happened to make that mercury rise 760 millimeters high in that inverted test tube. And so that's called one atmosphere of pressure is the weight pushing down on every square inch of, you know, your skin or of ground or whatever it might be. Now there's lots of units for air pressure. Uh, don't get overly confused. I'll make sure you have all of these conversion factors. Really the only two or three that we're going to care about are atmospheres, one atmosphere is the weight of this air column pushing down on you. And that comes out to be not insignificant, about 15 PSI or pounds per square inch. So every square inch of, of surface on your hand is holding 15 pounds. How come we don't feel it? Well, obviously we evolved under that air pressure. So our cells are pushing out at the same pressure that the air is pushing down. Um, uh, you guys will recognize this when you change air pressure. If you go driving up a mountain very fast, your ears pop, okay? Or you dive to the bottom of the pool. It's not air pressure, but it's pressure. Uh, and you feel it. It's painful. So when that equilibrium is upset, you'll know it. 
Um, here's Tor or Torricelli. Millimeters of Mercury is named after uh, Evangelista Torricelli. It's called Tor. Um, and that's, again, 29.9 inches of mercury. We occasionally use pascals, uh, which is the metric unit, the SI unit of pressure. That's a big number. I'll give it to you. But if you wanted to remember, it's just 10 to the fifth. 10 to the fifth pascals is equal to one atmosphere of pressure. That's pretty close. Uh, you know, 1% error. We can we can deal with that. All right, we're going to go through a couple of, of quick of uh, gas individual gas laws very quickly. First is Boyle's law. Boyle's law relates pressure and volume, and I think you guys know this. If you increase pressure on a gas, it's going to decrease volume. So notice it is an inverse relationship. If you increase pressure, you decrease the volume. So that's kind of important to know. It's an inverse relationship. And by the way, we're going to hold other variables constant in this case. So it's constant temperature and constant number of moles. All right. Um, so uh, because it varies inversely, if you double the pressure, you're going to half the volume of a gas. If you triple the pressure, it's one third of the volume of a gas. So here's a cartoon version of this. Notice we start with one uh, liter of gas at 298 Kelvin. That's 25 degrees C. Okay. And that's one atmosphere of pressure. If we double the atmospheric pressure, okay, it's one half the volume. 0.5 liters. If we quadruple the atmospheric pressure from the initial conditions, it's one quarter the volume. So inverse relationship. Uh, the other thing that Boyle's law predicts is this, is pressure times volume is a constant. An inverse law will do this, right? If I increase the pressure, the volume decreases. If I double the pressure, half the volume. So if you multiply those numbers, let's put a multiplication symbol in there, okay? You're going to get a constant. That value never changes, which means um, there's a constant value of pressure times volume. And this is important because what this will tell us is if we have some initial Initial conditions, and by the way, I've written it again down here, P1 v, PV1 times V1, or the initial pressure times the volume, is going to be equal to the final pressure times volume. That number is a constant, okay? And we can use that to, to solve some equations. Let me show you an example of the mathematics of that. So notice uh, we've got seven different experiments here at a whole bunch of different pressures. The first one is atmospheric pressure, but all the rest are increments of that. And we start with a volume. Remember, if we increase volume going down the table like this, we should uh, decrease, I'm sorry, increase pressure going down the table, we should decrease volume. And you see that. What's important here is look what the pressure times volume ends up to be, just about the same number right there. So pressure times volume is a constant. So if we know P times V for initial conditions, and we know one of the two for the final conditions, either pressure or volume, we can figure out the third. And that's what's shown here in this example, uh, example problem. Okay, let's take the atmospheric pressure at the peak of Mount Everest, 29,000 feet in the air, is about 525 millimeters of mercury. That's pretty low, about a third less compared to 760 millimeters at, uh, at sea level. Now, most um, climbers will carry 10 liter tanks of oxygen pressurized to very high pressure, 30,000 millimeters of mercury. So look at this. We know an initial volume and an initial pressure. And the question is, what's the final volume? You could even write, what's the final volume when, gas is, when that gas is released at the summit? So imagine taking that 10 liter tank and stupidly opening it up and inflating a balloon. How big is that balloon going to be? Okay, so set this up just like M1V1 equals M2V2 or the normality equation, NAVA equals NBVB, and just write in your uh, the things you know and the thing you don't know. And then it's going to be easy to solve. So what I did is um, I wrote up P1V1 equals P2V2, and then I want to solve for V2 or V final. So I just divided both sides by the P2, substitute the values in, and you get 571 liters. So that's pretty amazing that he had a 10 liter tank on his back, but if he opens, or he or she opens that valve, he can inflate a 570 liter balloon. That shows you the kind of pressures that you deal with in, in carrying around a tank of gas. All right, Charles Law. Uh, Jacques Charles was a balloonist in the late 1700s in France. Ballooning was a, was a, was a, a aeronautical ballooning was the first way humans could fly. It was a huge fad, a big raging uh, 
interest in France at the time. But he wondered why. Why is it that when I heat up a gas, uh, it it floats compared to the gas around it if I heat up air. And he elucidated a law that says if you increase temperature, you increase volume. So notice this is a direct proportion and not an inverse proportion. Okay. Uh, whoops. Let's uh, do that again. Okay. So again, in, in a direct proportion, if you increase temperature, you increase volume. You heat up a gas, it's going to expand. Okay, um, and if you take a look at this cartoon version, here's temperature is 200 degrees Kelvin. If I double the temperature to 400 degrees Kelvin, I double the volume from half a liter over here to a full liter over there. Notice um, atmospheric pressure is constant, and notice also we are doing our temperatures in Kelvin. Okay. Now, something really interesting fell out of Jacques Charles' experiment. Uh, Oh, we can come back to that in a minute. So Jacques Charles took uh, actual data from his ballooning experiments uh, and, and increased the temperature of a sample of gas by about 50 degrees, shown here on the left, and measured the volume. And I've taken the liberty of throwing those up onto a curve. And you can see here that as temperature increases, the volume increases, not a surprise. But something really interesting fell out of Jacques Charles's work. And what if we draw a best fit line through those points, okay? And take a look at what it does. That's, a, that's pretty good right there. Um, notice that if you cool down a gas enough, we reach a point where it gets to zero degrees Kelvin and a volume of zero liters. Now, that's a little strange. Um, how can you have matter with zero volume. Well, this was the first sort of inkling of this idea called absolute zero, that if you take any gas, it doesn't have to be air, it can be helium or methane or water vapor shown here. And if you cool it down and extrapolate the lines back to uh, where they all meet, they meet at the origin where the temperature absolute zero, uh, temperature Kelvin is zero, and the volume in liters is also zero. And this is one of the reasons why the idea of absolute zero may be a made up thing, something we can never observe, because the idea of matter, gas molecules, having zero volume is a mathematical construct. Um, so, by the way, notice some of these lines are dotted. That's because if you keep cooling a gas down, eventually it'll condense to a liquid, and then you can't, you know, keep experimenting on the gas because it's a liquid then. So these lines are just extrapolated past the point where they've condensed to a liquid. Okay. Back up to Charles' law. Uh, again, um, to direct relationship, direct relationships are going to look like this. And once again, we have uh, a constant that uh, shows up. Um, but this time it's V1 divided by T1 in Kelvin is equal to V2 over T2. Direct relationship makes sense. If I increase the temperature, it's going to increase the volume. And therefore, this number stays constant from initial to final conditions. So here's a quick mathematical problem demonstrating Charles' law. If you take a four liter balloon and you heat it up in your oven, yes, you can do this. I don't recommend it. Uh, but from room temperature to about 500 degrees Kelvin, notice you got to convert those temperatures to Kelvin. What's the final volume of this original four liter balloon if we heat it up from 298 to 523K? All right. So we're going to use v1 v1 over t1 equals v2 over t2 write down your variables substitute in and solve super easy so the answer is it almost doubles in size and that's because the temperature almost doubles goes uh, uh, doubling would be around 600 degrees kelvin so that's a reasonable that's a reasonable answer now there's a couple more gas laws that i'm not going to spend a ton of time on one of them is called Guy Lussac's law right here it's the relationship between temperature and pressure if you have a rigid container container and you heat it up uh, pressure will increase if enough so that you could possibly burst the container this is why you never ever throw a can of hairspray into a fire it's going to increase the temperature so much that it's going to burst the walls of the container and that contains a flammable uh, accelerant or, or propellant inside the uh, inside the hairspray so it could be really dangerous um, but this, this is obvious Guy Lussac's law now Here's all three of those uh, put together. Um, combined gas law takes all those three things and puts them together. So notice Boyle's law 
is pressure volume at constant temperature, et cetera. Charles law, constant pressure. Can we throw them all together? And the answer is yes. So when we do that, we get what's called the combined gas law. And that's P, P, P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 times V2 over T2 and also is equal to a constant. Another thing to keep in, uh, in mind here is that we're keeping the number of moles constant. We're not increasing or decreasing the amount of gas. Okay. Now, how is it that Boyle's law is in this? Well, remember at constant temperature, that says we can get rid of this T1 and T2. And look, you get P1 V1 equals P2 V2, and that's Boyle's law. So if you keep any of those variables constant, these three laws will fall out of it. So let's take an example, quick example of, uh, of the combined gas law. So this problem is an interesting one because it looks like it combines some opposing forces. It's a 500, weather a 500 liter weather balloon at sea level, okay, and 25 degrees C, uh, so that looks like standard temperature and pressure conditions, is brought up to the summit of Everest again, where the pressure is about a third less and the temperature is much colder. What's the new volume? So think about what's competing here. We are decreasing the atmospheric pressure so the balloon should expand under decreasing pressure, right? That's, that's Charles' law. Uh, I'm sorry, that's Boyle's law. Uh, but we're also cooling the gas down, and so it should contract. That's Charles' law. Can the combined gas law solve for this? Okay. And by the way, we are assuming this constant number of uh, constant number of of moles. N equals um, N equals constant. So, you know, which is going to win? Well, let's take a look. All right. So we we write down the variables we know, and then we're just going to substitute into that expression right here. That's shown. Uh, down here and just crank through the numbers, plug and chug, and you end up with V2 is 613 liters. So the volume, um, the, the pressure actually wins out. And that kind of makes sense because the temperature has uh, risen by, uh, has changed only by about 70 degrees Kelvin or one quarter of its original value. Whereas the pressure has de decreased by a third, a much greater increase. And therefore the pressure decrease, which will tend to expand the balloon, wins out. All right, this is going to get us into the next Ed puzzle, which will start to talk about changing the number of moles. And of course, if we're talking about moles, we're talking about the potential for bringing in stoichiometry work into uh, chemical equations that generate gas. Uh, very good. I will talk to you next time. Keep up the good work.